Real-time strategy games, or RTSs for short, have provided players with a more cerebral approach to gaming for decades, often putting them in charge of vast armies and providing complex campaigns to navigate. Subsets of the RTS genre have become mainstream media and staple of esports, with the MOBA League of Legends becoming the face of the industry, filling out stadiums across the globe. But this episode of Origins is not about the competitive gaming giant, and instead focuses on one of the most transformative titles in the genre, that's as much about historical accuracy as it is enjoyable to play. Get ready for a history lesson like no other, as we uncover the origins of Age of Empires. Like many genres, and video gaming as a whole, Real-time strategy began its life in a 2D format, with a little-known game called War of Nerves. This bird's-eye view screen of a red battlefield is shared by two players who control opposing army generals, aiming to evade capture from their opposition's advancing robot army. At its core, it was the first real-time strategy game, as each player's input had an immediate action carried out by the computer. However, while players controlled the movements of the army generals, the robot armies were AI-controlled, meaning the entirety of the game's events were not down to the player's decisions, and that the jury is still out on whether this can be classed as a fully RTS game. Similar games like this began to release over the next decade, but it wasn't till 1989 that a real claim for the first fully human-controlled RTS game was made, when Herzog 2 flew onto the Sega Mega Drive. Translated from German into English, Duke 2 was the first single and multiplayer game that combined strategic thinking without the need for turn-based decision-making. Players chose from an army of flying mechs to do battle across various terrains. Added elements of resource management, constructing units, and refueling gave players a lot to manage, whilst constantly changing methods of attack from the AI in single-player mode meant repetitive tactics wouldn't work, and forced players to be adaptive in their strategy to win the game. The 90s paved the way for more titles in the strategy genre, with turn-based games challenging the real-time titles throughout the decade. In 1991, Designers Sid Meier and Bruce Shelley released Civilization. The aim of the game was to go from the early ages, with skills like pottery making, right through to future centuries of successful nuclear fusion. The winner was crowned when someone won the space race, and was the first to send their civilians to the Alpha Centauri star system, or simply eradicated their enemies. Strangely, gaming had got to this point without the differing strategy genres being actively defined, until finally, in 1992, Brett Sperry coined the phrase real-time strategy to market his upcoming game Dune 2. He'd build it as the first ever game in this brand new genre, and it was a hybrid sequel to David Lynch's 1984 film, Dune. The game focused on three separate sides known as interplanetary houses that fought for control of the fictional planet Arrakis. The game, which we now know wasn't quite the first RTS title in history, did introduce a number of unique elements that continue to be used in the genre today. Most notably, the fog of war aspect, that allowed players to only see parts of the map that they'd explored with their army. Other additions to the game saw unique abilities for each faction, with different weaponry and units at each house's disposal. However, a significant drawback of the game meant it was only single player, and many criticized the capability of the AI opponent, which only attacked a player's base front on, demonstrating no ability to flank. The next few years saw a surge in RTS gaming, and some well-known franchises began their journeys. Blizzard Entertainment entered the scene in 1994, with their debut strategy title, Warcraft Orcs and Humans, and followed this up a year later with Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness. It was through these earliest games in the Warcraft franchise that Blizzard secured their finances for the future, allowing them to get to work on other projects. Development studios everywhere were turning their attention to the rapidly growing RTS genre, with the benchmark raised with every release. Most of the titles being produced came from recognized development names, and this was no place for a new company to try its luck. But nobody told this to the budding Texas-based developers Ensemble Studios. Ensemble Studios had been founded in 1994 by Tony Goodman, who had a fondness for the RTS genre and was keen to jump on the momentum of this bandwagon. Alongside Tony came a familiar face in the strategy gaming world, Bruce Shelley. Bruce, if you remember, was a lead designer for the 1991 turn-based title Civilization, and was ready to dive into the realms of real-time strategy by heading up an entirely new game. 
The majority of titles and franchises in the RTS genre had so far gone with fantasy or sci-fi settings, such as the conflict-ridden world of Azeroth in Warcraft, or the desolate and unforgiving planet of Arrakis in Dune 2. Ensemble were keen to differentiate themselves from the outset, taking inspiration from Civilization. They decided to focus on the historical elements and build a franchise that charted humanity's growth by spotlighting the most famous empires from history. Their working title was Dawn of Man, and the game began quite literally from the Dawn of Man in the Stone Ages, traveling through the Tool and Bronze Age before finishing up in the Iron Age. The team wanted to remain as historically accurate as they could, yet stuck to surface level research, taking information from the children's sections of libraries so as not to get bogged down in the finer details. The thinking behind this was that the game needed to appeal to hardcore gamers, who'd be quick to point out historical inaccuracies. However, the game needed to be easily understandable for the casual gamer too, and too much detail might make it feel like a history lesson, rather than, well, a game. To keep up with the authentic feel to the game, musical director Stephen Rippey composed a musical score for each of the four ages, working with instruments actually available during the different eras depicted within the game. These eras marked a player's journey as they developed their town center and civilization, unlocking new units and research possibilities to further their progress. But Ensemble were clever and introduced an addition to their game unseen in the RTS genre before. They added four completely different campaigns that followed the historical development of separate architectural settings. These were the Egyptians, Greeks, Babylonians, and the Yamato. Better still, these settings each had three civilization or cultural types to choose from, each with unique buildings, warriors, and other aspects that kept the game fresh. Dune 2 had set the standard with three playable factions, and Warcraft had two sides to choose from, but Age of Empires had 12 unique perspectives to play the game from. There was one change left to make, with Ensemble realizing the campaign finished well beyond the early ages of man, and thus they renamed the title to Age of Empires. Released first in North America in late 1997, and then Europe and Asia the following February, Age of Empires was available for Microsoft Windows and Mac OS computers. But Ensemble would have been naive to think that they would be the only ones launching a new RTS game, and Age of Empires was about to face some stiff competition. Remember Blizzard Entertainment, the brains behind the now very profitable Warcraft series? Well, they'd been busy cooking up a brand new franchise, and were ready for launch at the same time as Age of Empires. A few weeks after Ensemble had released their RTS debut game, Blizzard launched StarCraft, their second RTS franchise but with graphics and features far beyond anything they'd made before in the Warcraft genre. The two games battled it out over the next year, both proving a hit with consumers across the world. But 1998 finished with StarCraft as the best-selling title, with over 1.5 million copies sold, some few hundred thousand ahead of Age of Empires, which had still cleared a million sales. Strangely though, StarCraft wasn't a top performer in America, where Age of Empires generated the majority of its interest. Instead, South Korea took to StarCraft like a duck to water, accounting for nearly half of all the game's sales. Blizzard's title had undergone more rigorous playtesting than Age of Empires, and was, mechanically speaking, a much better game. The Asian market usually only settled for the best, and so to them, StarCraft was the clear choice. Ensemble were still pleased with Age of Empires' success, and had a trick up their sleeve. In October 1998, they released the expansion pack Rise of Rome, giving players a completely new campaign and historical setting to immerse themselves in, which focused on, you guessed it, the Roman Empire. But anything Ensemble could do, Blizzard could seemingly do better, as they dropped their own expansion pack, Brood War, on the gaming market just over a month later. Again, the StarCraft expansion's mechanics were leagues ahead of Ensemble's efforts, and lent itself to becoming the obvious choice for the competitive gaming circuit that was growing in South Korea. Ensemble had fallen far behind in this market, but they weren't about to panic and change their strategy. Instead, they focused on their strengths and got to work on a new title for their Western fanbase. Eager to build on the momentum that Age of Empires and Rise of Rome had built, Ensemble went back to the history books and flicked through countless battles before arriving at the Middle Ages. Stories of famous leaders and their own campaigns of war from the 12th to the 15th century inspired the Ensemble development team, 
as they plotted the paths of figureheads like Genghis Khan and Joan of Arc. These characters formed the backbone of their next title, as Ensemble went all out again to produce five completely different campaign stories, while once again making sure to include three sub-civilizations for each of the leaders to rule over, and provide players with even more choice. Development was quick as Ensemble used the same Genie game engine from their first title, but were conscious enough to update the AI. The game topped charts across the globe, from the US to the UK and even in South Korea. It remained popular for years to come, being the 10th highest selling game in 2001, two years after its original release. This was helped by the fact that Ensemble yet again released an expansion pack in late 2000, which followed more famous leaders like Attila the Hun and Montezuma. The game also brought in new multiplayer game modes, including King of the Hill, Defend the Wonder, and Wonder Race. The historically based Age of Empires was a top seller, and it looked like a formula had been established to just rinse and repeat. But Ensemble, ever keen to keep stuff from going stale, wanted to take things in a different direction for their next title. The final years of the 20th century had seen a surge of popularity for strategy games, and among the titles that were pushing boundaries with each and every release, there stood Age of Empires. The game had proved a robust and leading figure in the genre, both critically and commercially. It had been a mega hit across the world, with its first two installments and subsequent expansion packs selling millions of CD-ROMs to a broad audience of casual gamers and strategy aficionados alike. Creators Ensemble were continuously driven to create fresh experiences for their audiences, and this was something they were going to take seriously with their next title. Off the back of Age of Empires' success, Microsoft bought Ensemble Studios outright for a very round $100 million. Up to this point, Microsoft had acted as just a publisher for the game, but now wanted to cement their partnership and demonstrate their full backing towards Ensemble, as well as provide further support and resources. In early 2001, there were rumors flying around that Ensemble had developed a new game engine, and it wasn't long before they confirmed it was true. Their new Bang engine was ready for use, and a game codenamed RTS3 was going to be the first to use it. RTS3 turned out to be a step into uncharted territory for Ensemble, finding inspiration in mythological legends instead of historical events to create Age of Mythology. Uh, Age of Mythology is the biggest project we've ever taken on. We've never taken on a project of such epic proportions before. And because of that, you know, we needed a bigger team than we've ever had before. And also, this project took three years, which is longer than we've ever worked on a project before. So this really stretched us creatively and technically. The game followed a similar format to the previous Age of Empires titles, as players advanced through four different ages. However, rather than civilizations, players chose from three different cultures, inspired by different ancient mythological beliefs. Each culture had a major god overseeing the growth of their tribe. Zeus was the major god for the Greeks, Ra oversaw the Egyptians, and Odin was at the head of the Norse culture. As players progressed through the Archaic Age, through the Classical and Heroic Ages, and finished at the Mythological Age, they unlocked more minor gods, who each had abilities to help improve their tribe's growth. The three major gods possessed the most powerful abilities, with Zeus's lightning bolts the most formidable, raining down on enemy units and destroying everything they struck, displaying the awesome power of these historical deities. The game was not just different to the previous titles because of mythological-based settings instead of historical, it only included one campaign, where the others had many, but Ensemble made sure that this campaign was substantial, and it was considerably longer than any other in the Age of Empires series to make up for it. One of the really interesting things we tried to do in Age of Mythology this time was put a lot more time and resources into the single-player campaign. One of the ways we did that was through our in-game cinematics as well as gameplay, our in-game cinematics are so cool, you can get down close to the heroes and the characters in the game and watch them in between the actual scenarios, and then the camera seamlessly comes back out to the gameplay view, and the players are actually playing with the characters that they just watched in the cinematic. Titled Fall of the Trident, the campaign follows Atlantean war hero Arkantos as he discovers why the god Poseidon is now harshly treated by the people of Atlantis. 
His journey takes him through famous mythological tales like the Trojan Horse at Troy, the Viking Apocalypse Ragnarok, and finally, to an understanding of how the lost city of Atlantis became, as the name suggests, lost. The campaign blended together all three cultures in a whirlwind adventure that was praised heavily for its originality and ingenuity. Age of Mythology went on sale in the back end of 2002, with yet another expansion pack, the Titans, released a year after this, introducing a new culture of the Atlanteans and their major god, Kronos. The game was immensely popular and remained in America's top 10 bestsellers list for the next four years, displaying a longevity to the title that was far from expected. Ensemble had successfully strayed from the script, but were ready to pick it back up again and form a more concrete trilogy for the main title franchise. With a successful spin-off game in the bank, Ensemble were confident that reverting back to the historical settings was the correct next move. They picked up where they left off, and while campaigns from the first two games didn't exactly involve the same characters, the time frame continually shifted forwards. With this in mind, Ensemble began the next campaign from the 1400s and recreated the European colonization of America, stretching all the way to the 1800s. This period of human history was filled with great exploration and technological advancements, but for Ensemble Studios, they were more interested in the constant wars and bloody conflicts of this era. Players chose from eight different European civilizations and their famous leaders, such as Napoleon Bonaparte leaving the French civilization and Russia led by Ivan the Terrible. Age of Empires III introduced the home city system, an unattackable base which leveled up as players progressed through the game. Progress on the home city was continuous and would benefit players by sending them resources and reinforcements in game modes across Age of Empires III. This included both single and multiplayer modes and was a key ingredient in motivating gamers to carry on playing, awarding them with advantages to use against their opponents the more they played. As for the campaign, it was presented in three acts over the four century timeline. Ensemble created the fictional Black Family as the different descendants continued to defend the mythical fountain of youth throughout the campaign. While described as well-written and well-framed, the campaign was widely considered as one of the weakest in the series, as it lacked the heart and courage to depict the real actions of these times, including epidemics and slavery, which were clearly absent from the game. The fictitious events and mythological fountain of youth felt more at home in the previous spin-off title, and overall, left players expecting more. Despite a week of the normal campaign, Age of Empires III was the first title in the series to come fully integrated with multiplayer gaming, which quickly became its most played component. The main title released in 2005, and Ensemble had two expansion packs ready to go over the next two years. The first was Age of Empires III War Chiefs, allowing players to take control of Native American civilizations such as the Aztecs. These civilizations were already in the game, but players were limited to attacking or allying with the AI-controlled tribes, and an update to control them added a sense of diversity and role reversal from the many European-type civilizations. Ensemble's prevalence and mastery of the RTS genre hadn't gone unnoticed, and it was at this point they were asked by Microsoft to develop a real-time strategy game for the Halo series. This was a major project, and Ensemble already had a second expansion pack in development for Age of Empires III. Fortunately, an independent development company, Big Huge Games, stepped forward, asking to partner with Ensemble for their next expansion pack. Employees at Big Huge Games were huge fans of Age of Empires and wanted to be a part of the series in any way they could. Ensemble were only too happy to shake hands over a partnership, and together they produced the second expansion pack, Asian Dynasties. This provided three more civilizations, representing India, China, and Japan, for players to choose from and, avid as ever to please the fanbase, also included new miniature campaigns to make up for the disappointment of the main campaign. By the end of 2007, Age of Empires III had sold over 2 million copies, but Ensemble's attention had turned fully to their Halo RTS game, which they'd named Halo Wars. It was another two years until Halo Wars was published by Microsoft, and in general, the reviews were positive, and the already established Halo fanbase took to it without much prompting. Commercially, it was nothing compared to Age of Empires, which after a trilogy and one spin-off, seemed to be complete in Ensemble Studios' eyes. Whether this was their decision or not remains a bit of a mystery, but ultimately, Halo Wars marked the final game produced by Ensemble. Following Halo Wars' release, it was announced that Microsoft would be shutting down the Ensemble development studios. 
It wasn't a mass firing, with many of Ensemble's employees going to work for different companies under the Microsoft umbrella. Despite all of this, Age of Empires continued to make rebooted appearances, with 15 expansion pack additions and renewed versions of the original games released by Xbox Game Studios. The most noteworthy of these came from the aptly named development studio Forgotten Empires, who released two new expansion packs, Lords of the West and Dawns of the Dukes, for the updated Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. These, like all the expansion packs before them, introduced more playable civilizations and campaign scenarios for players to get stuck into, but however nice bits and pieces of additional content were, this was no substitute for what the fans were really after. With Ensemble out of the picture, fans believed the history book had been closed on any new major titles in the series. That was till 2017, when Microsoft announced that a very familiar name in the RTS genre would be taking the mantle and leading development for Age of Empires 4. The future of the series was passed on to none other than Relic Entertainment, creators of the Warhammer 40k Dawn of War franchise. All seemed like a dream, but two years down the line, and with not so much as a leaked still from the game, fans began to give up believing once again. Relic acknowledged their frustration and revealed details about the game, announcing that the series was heading back to the 11th century for the Norman era, once explored in Age of Empires 2. Fans were on board with this, and with four brand new campaigns, including a reenactment of the Battle of Hastings, presented in glorious modern graphics, this RTS reboot looks to have ticked all boxes. Only time will tell if this newest installment can live up to the hype of its predecessors, but one thing is for sure there's a new chapter in the history of Age of Empires. Real-time strategy gaming has come a long way since the days of War of Nerves and Herzog's Vi, but Age of Empires holds its own unique place in shaping the genre. A game focused on historically accurate warfare was judged as a big risk among the multiple fantasy titles of the genre, but while Age of Empires wasn't taken up on the competitive gaming circuit, it established its own unique audience with its accessible design. Consistently strong campaigns alongside an array of ways to play the franchise over and over has meant the longevity of the series has surpassed everybody's expectations, and the imminent arrival of a brand new title in the series proves the popularity of the game is as strong, if not stronger, than it was back in the late 90s and early 2000s. If Relic Entertainment can emulate the fine attention to detail that Ensemble managed throughout their reign, then we should have another classic on our hands. Thank you for watching Age of Empires Origins. We'll be back soon with a brand new story from the world of gaming.